All right, let's make a formal introduction for our uh, Good afternoon, Stephen. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the Studio Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Stephen Taylor Taylor accepted our invitation to a show. Stephen, welcome to the show, man. Hi, Claudio. Nice to meet you. Same here. Same here. Uh, let's go back to the beginning, man. Were you born like in a in a musical family? How, how old were you when you perhaps began taking, you know, piano lessons or guitar lessons when you uh, were a little a little kid? Interesting question. Um, I grew up in in a family of uh, with I had two brothers and two sisters. I was the youngest. Um, <clears throat> my eldest brother had. Um, I mean, my parents weren't music uh, musical at all, but my eldest brother had been. Uh, taken into um, a, a chapel choir in in Oxford, and uh, when it came round to me, I followed in his shoes, and I I'd actually started learning the piano at the age of six, but, but because my parents seemed interested that my brother had been interested in music, uh, and so I was given an opportunity to get to uh, go for a. Mu uh, uh, a choral scholarship to New College Chapel in Oxford, which is at the time one of the top um, uh, chapel choirs in the UK. And uh, I was accepted. So I, I kind of started there at the age of eight. I went off to boarding school to learn how to be a chorister. And, yeah. and they started to teach me also the piano and, and the recorder. And within a year or two, I was actually... After being a probation, I was taken into the choir. And my musical career sort of developed very quickly through this. Uh, and I got quite good at, um, uh, at singing and was soon soloing uh, with, along with the choir. And I started to learn the clarinet and I got good grades in the clarinet. And so by the age of 13, I'd actually... Already, my voice had been heard on broadcasts and on on LPs, along with the New College Choir, and so my parents put me in for a um, a music scholarship to a public school. I mean, uh, in the UK, a public schools is the name for the private schools. The private school here in the United yes, States. Yes, yeah. yes, and um, so, but uh, we weren't a, we weren't a really particularly wealthy family. My father was a bank manager, but uh, we were sort of middle middle of the road sort of family and uh, so I had to get scholarships so I got a musical scholarship which paid for my education uh, and I continued to learn the uh, clarinet and the church organ uh, but in the meantime I was discovering sort of from my eld eldest brothers and sisters I was discovering uh, the records they were listening to which was basically um, the Beatles, the Stones, the Beach Boys and as I sort of approached the age of 14, I started to discover things like Pink Floyd uh, with C. Emily Play, which was the first seven inch single I ever bought. And so as I was interested in this, I picked up a guitar as well. And, um, and a couple of years later, I picked up an electronic organ uh, and so I was really getting into all different genres of music at this point. I was still playing in solo concert, classical concerts and uh, in music ensembles, but I also formed a band and we started doing covers and things like that. Wow, amazing. Man. So, and, then when, and then when I, sorry, I just, I'll complete this journey. Yeah. I'm sorry if it goes on a bit long. No, but, no, no. When I, I, I didn't complete my time at this public school, um, the music had sort of gone all right, but I, in, in a lot of ways, I didn't really fit in. So I left, but uh, I was still interested in following the, uh, the whole music idea. So I applied to the Royal College of Music in London yeah. uh, to learn the clarinet with one of the top clarinetists in the country, who was the chairman of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, Colin Bradbury. So I went off and spent three years studying music at the Royal College of Music, but at the same time. I was playing in bands and playing in ensembles and experimental ensembles. But by the time I finished at the end of college, I decided I didn't particularly want to be a performer. I didn't particularly, 
I certainly didn't want to get into teaching. I had been teaching while I was a student. And but during the previous years, uh, recording had become my hobby. And so literally the the last day I finished um, uh, at, at the Royal College of Music, beginning of some holidays, it was like, well, what do I do now? Uh, and I jumped on a train and went up to the West End of London and I thought, well, I'll try a recording studio and see if I can get a start. Temporary job just to keep me keep me going. And I walked into this studio that had this name Trident Studios outside. And I walked in, and I, I said, uh, I'm looking for a temporary job, uh, you know, just sort of tied me over until I decide what I want to do. Uh, and um the receptionist said, hang on a minute, I'll speak to the studio manager. And she said, OK, um, he'd like to see you. Go on up. And uh, long story short, uh, <laughs> they, they needed someone. Uh, I wasn't quite what they were looking for. I was a bit bit old, a bit overeducated and a bit too posh, they they told me. But uh, <laughs> but they but they they got me to start the next day as a tea boy. And kind of that was the start of this incredible journey uh, yeah. and that was 1974 so a long wow. time. <laughs> amazing and uh feel free to but at the same time i think you were i read somewhere that you you were already arranged to go for training at the bbc like that six right. months after that so you yeah well of that's, course they, they yeah. say in january and we are looking at july so you say hey i get it i better get a job now i don't want to wait until what do i do until january right so. well that, that's kind of, yes you you got that right i had while i was a while i was a student i uh i i looked for an opportunity to get training you know real traditional training in the recording industry uh and i got a place at the bbc but uh <clears throat> you're right um it this was August when I was finishing college and they wanted me to start in January. So looking for the temporary job was uh, was something to do in the meantime. Uh, and because it worked out, I therefore I didn't bother going to the BBC. I did. I became an apprentice instead, you know, or yeah. a tea boy, actually, <laughs> making the tea and fetching the meals and looking after yeah. the reception and everything like that. What, what, so what, what the, I don't know, simple question, what, what's the role of a, a, a tea person? Just serving tea, you know, different musicians like the Queens were going to try the studio and then yes. you will ask, tea boy, you know, what tea type boy, of tea yeah. do you like or what? Yeah, you wanna... it, it's, it's kind of like that. You're basically a runner. Uh, a runner. You, you're, yeah. you, you're just, you're just doing all the odd jobs, fetching and carrying, you know, if, yeah. if a band, want tea or coffee you'd go upstairs make it bring it to them and they might say can you go out and get me a sandwich or a pizza or and at one point um i even uh, was asked to cook for uh, some sessions you know scrambled eggs on toast or stuff like that or omelets you know it, it, it was it really was a very uh it interesting and diverse sort of beginning oh i had to you know i had to go and collect things from head office or visit the post office. You were just doing all the odd jobs and sitting on reception at night time, uh, uh, being security. Uh, and when I started, the job actually involved you being there 24 hours on and then 24 hours off, That which is an extraordinary way to, to work. And I'm sure it would be totally illegal these days. Of course. But it's. It, I think all of this is a way of seeing if you're, if you've got the stamina and the strength to, to, you know, just be bossed around, and to, for them to find out what your character's like and whether they think you're worthy of going up to the next stage, which is to become, uh, what they used to call a tape op, uh, tape operator or or an assistant engineer, and so. Um, Lots of people didn't make it beyond the T boy stage. Really? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was trial by fire. Twenty four hours, man. But so, but that's that's impossible. But the, 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 so the, the studios worked twenty four hours a day. I mean, they were yes. 
A lot of yes. musicians, right, sleep during the day and then they go no, to no. work at night. Oh, no, no. Well, what, what it was is um, uh, studio time was so precious in those days. Um, uh, you'd have two studios, uh, two sessions a day, uh, a 10 hour session in the main studio, then an hour changeover. And during the night, another band would come in and you'd set up. And so that would alternate like that. And the same in the mix room. Uh, not all the time. Occasionally, um, uh, if you wanted to block book the studio and not have those day and night sessions with different uh, clients, you had to book and pay for 80, an 18-hour 18 day. And so uh, to secure the 24-hour period with no one else coming in. Uh, so because clients were paying for 18 hours a day, they were quite often working 18 hours a day. I did lots and lots of sessions when I became an engineer where you literally were working for 18 hours, six, six hours off. And that includes traveling time to get home. So it was, it really was very hard work. My God, my God. <laughs> so I suppose at the beginning, right, you were the D guy running errands, you know, cooking and making sandwiches and pick up, picking up stuff from different offices. Yeah, you yeah. got to know in the sense, you got to know in the sense that you opened the door for the, I don't know, the queen guys, I suppose, at the time, 76, 77, all the big upcoming names, right? Well, it, it, it was incredible that my first few weeks as a, as a tea boy, I, I took, uh, Trays of tea into sessions for Queen for uh, when they were just doing killer the Qu killer Queen mix, Ace yeah. with How Long. There was Super Tramp with Bloody Well Right. Uh, there were all kinds of great oh God, that were being made, you know. And that that was this was my introduction to it all. I had no idea. I, I had just walked in off the street for this. <laughs> and you, you you knew who they were. Ooh, Super Tramp was yes, I did. Yes. Um, well, actually, no, I, I probably hadn't heard of Super Tramp before, but yeah. I had been quite a music fan. Um, yeah. I'd say during my, uh, we're now talking about 50 years ago. I mean, it's quite, a, yeah. quite an important 50th yeah. anniversary. Just before I started at Trident, I was, I was quite the fan. I was buying Genesis Records. I was buying um, uh, Van de Graaff Generator. Uh, yeah. Mike Oldfield, um, uh, trying to remember all the other ones. Um, but, I mean, Green Slade, um, wow. uh, all kinds, all kinds of things. Uh, Hard Camel, you know, there, there were all kinds. Wow. Of things. So I was, I was getting, oh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, King Crimson. Yeah. I, uh, I had all these in my collection. And so I, I'd, I'd become quite into that genre. I in fact played in a band for a short while that um called Thomas where I played bass and electric clarinet <laughs> it was very weird but um it didn't last but um but I remember during that time uh, we were introduced to the management who were looking after Daryl Way from Curved Air and so you know I we were sort of in I was in that kind of world and I was very familiar with a lot of these bands. And it just so happened Trident had been, um, you know, it, it, I'd, I'd really f fallen into the right place at that time. It's quite incredible. Yeah. When well, you think Trident, looking back, was so pivotal, was so important in the music business. Mm. And there were many, many studios, right? You, you, you know... You got lucky that you were walking down the street that you happened to be in the place. Yeah. Yeah, but well, the why do you think that, Trident yeah. was so popular? Or was so... Well, t uh, Trident uh, was interesting because, I mean, it, it, it really made its name working initially with the Beatles, uh, Hey Jude, and some of the White Album had been done there. Because yeah. uh, Trident had one of the first eight-track recording setups in, in the UK. Uh, and so people were quite keen to try that. But um, but a lot of uh, classic records were made there with David Bowie and T-Rex and Lou Reed and all kinds of really Elton John, you know, all the early stuff had been done there slightly before my time, although I did yeah. 
a few of these people as there was a sort of crossover period. But the thing about Trident was it had a very uh, different attitude to other studios like um, Abbey Road and um, Air Studios, which had more uh, had quite a traditional and strict sort of way of working. You know, you'd have at Abbey Road, you'd have a lot of the engineers and the technicians wearing, you know, white coats or brown coats and carrying clipboards. And it was very sort of old fashioned. Trident came along and it was trying to be sort of groundbreaking and breaking the rules, in fact, uh, almost sonically. So uh, in, in a lot of studios, there were particular ways that you should or shouldn't use microphones or the equipment and all this Trident just didn't care it was like what works is what you hear and you experiment and take chances and that's what may i think made Trident very important for that period was developing its own sound this is the thing that happened with studios back then um it changed during the 80s but back then each studio was known for having its own sound uh, and its own in-house staff. What happened in the 80s was that equipment started to get more generic and because people like to be able to move from one studio to another with similar equipment. And also freelance engineers became the thing. In the 70s, each studio had its house sound. It had its team and it had its equipment, and that created this sort of uh, character. I get it. I, I, I suppose that when you were doing the 24-hour period, you 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 didn't go home, right? You need to you sleep on a couch or on a sofa somewhere, a table. Well, when I went home, I, I mean, I really can't remember. It lasted six months, thank goodness. And it My wasn't... God, it wasn't... It, there was only at the beginning 24 hours on, 24 hours off yeah. happened. They then started a new system with three T-boys where, I don't know, there was kind of you did a day session, a night session, then you had a day off. Uh, but it, 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 as I say, it was all to try and get you to um, just to test your strength and your durability. <laughs> um, but and I can't remember sleeping. Uh, drank lots of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Or you know, or, or tea that you you guys drink there in or the tea. UK. Yes, I yeah. still make great tea. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and you, you, I don't know if you, you know, you look back often, and 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 if you look at your career in the last, I don't know, forty, fifty years, you have worked with Kate Bush, Susan Vega, Peter Gabriel, Stephen X, Rush, Tina Turner, uh, Jethro Tull, and. You know, Peter Gable, Genesis, and so on and so forth, man. Mm. It's it's amazing, man. It, some some engineers will be happy if they have worked with two of the names that I just mentioned. You have worked with all of them, man. Well, uh, it's really nice to work with really unique and sort of eclectic artists. That's the one thing that I've always been um, really delighted with. Uh, I haven't worked with so many real sort of mainstream uh pop acts uh i mean yes you could say tina turner certainly <laughs> you know you don't get much bigger than that uh, yeah. uh but um <clears throat> but working with artists like um stevie nicks and uh kate bush and peter gabriel they're all kind of really experimental and interesting and sort of on the edge which is uh, and yes i know they're hugely successful and sort of uh, yeah. in the front line but um but there's this this one thread of uh, I've been so lucky to work with, uh, you know, it's almost like the more sort of album oriented artists rather than uh, top twenty single artists. Uh, and also, I haven't got stuck in one, in just in one genre. It's not like I specialize just in uh, heavy metal or just in. Uh, I mean, yes, I know I, I, I've worked over the years with a lot of progressive uh, works, and particularly now as I'm doing a lot of remixing in box sets. But um, uh, yeah, it's um, I'm very lucky to have to have just worked with really interesting artists, really interesting people, um, and yeah, I, I 
don't know why I'm so lucky. <laughs> well, I, I do work hard. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, you're very good at what you do. You know, <laughs> that's why people will, you know, keep on coming back to you. But yeah. I suppose that all of all of in general terms, right? You know, are are those people that you mentioned, like the Peter Gabriel, the world, the the Kate Bush, the world, the I don't know, Steve Nicks, kind of nice in the real world. I I know them as some. Uh, as artists, right? You know them because you've been in the room with, you know, two, three meters apart from you for your people. How 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 those folks in in real life? Well, th- th- this is, uh, you know, I I never um, like to talk too much about, uh, you know, general term. personal, but yeah, general uh, term. but um, uh, what I will say is that I am absolutely so lucky. I'd say ninety. 90- Eight percent of the artists yeah. I've ever worked with have been an absolute delight, and I, you know, I've got very close to and become really friends. I mean, some people, uh, uh, although I'm at Real World, I, I haven't actually worked with Peter since, uh, you know, the seventies. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, but it was a great experience back then, and I very rarely see him these days. But uh, but these are all wonderful people. And Good. what I will say is that um, I'd I'd rather work with, in general, I'd rather work with great people, and maybe I'm not so keen on their music, rather than work with great music with people I don't like. So um, yeah, of course, yeah. So, so that's why I say I, I'm very lucky that there's only been a couple of rather poor moments uh in gotcha. all these yeah, years yeah. and it's almost almost nothing so uh, uh, all lovely people very different this is one of the other things is being able to switch you, you know every project you do closely with an artist is a journey you know and and you yeah. live the journey and then you move on and you start again with the next artist and um but i've had um there have been a few people i've had um recurring uh projects with over the years uh i mean from my years working uh, alongside producer rupert hein we worked as a production team for many many years um it was so great to have repeat uh projects like the band the fix we worked with in uh, back in the 80s yeah Um, we did four albums with them in the 80s and then consequently all these years later I'm, i've still been working with them off and on yeah. it's the same with howard jones um yeah. uh, uh you know just over his uh, the last 40 years over his career we've we've had ongoing slightly you know all uh, uh, the role has changed occasionally uh and then of course working with kate bush um work with her over a period of seven or eight years but on multiple projects and spending yeah. a long time together it's it's great having this repeat thing where where you're developing your your relationship and developing the the things that you end up producing or or, or mixing or whatever it is so uh, yeah in, in general uh Stephen, um a particular artist in general, right? You know, you can pick any name. Uh, they come to you, they come to a studio uh, with a preconceived idea of what they want to do, or you are re- or require your input, or you have the ability to say, well, with all due respect, you know, XYZ musician, I think we should do it like this. It's, you know, you should change that like that, or require your input. You, you have the the right to you know keep your point of view or or, or, the, or you need to stay in the background and, and do whatever they want you to do every project has has a different dynamic um yeah. you know in in the days um these days i'm not so much working on projects from start to finish um yeah. i'm more or less these days invited to come in at the mix stage oh, uh, okay to yeah. finish off but back when um, we worked from the very beginning to the very end of a project, it was very. Uh, it really depended on the the type of artist and who the production team were. Um, for instance, um, 
so a lot of bands come into the studio well rehearsed they know what they're going to do so the production team are there if you like as um just not just quality control but just to steer it in the correct direction and and um get the best out of it uh some bands come in wanting to sort of make it up as they go along or improvise and all the rest and that's that's where you can have quite a lot of influence i mean certainly as a sound engineer, you have quite a lot of influence on how the sound is captured and and uh, all the rest. But in terms of production, it really is different whoever you're working with. It, it, for instance, working with Rupert Hine, it, it, he was quite different working with a band who might have been come in well rehearsed, or if he was working with a solo singer or a solo artist who comes in with no... Um, particular um idea what musicians to bring in mm. how to do the arrangements so um all the projects i've worked on over the years it, it, people sort of approach you with different requirements and sometimes they just want you to get the best sound for them uh but particularly when coming to the mixing stage they're looking for the way you might see it or you might imagine it rather than just i've never really been just somebody pushing faders and t twiddling knobs for other people i always have some kind of input into how uh, how things develop um and sometimes you can you can make suggestions um or uh, suggest that something is removed or added or um but that's what makes it interesting. Everybody is so different, and um, mm. it, it's good when you when you hook up with somebody and and you have you develop a really interesting language uh, between you, where you can really interpret what each person is looking for. Got it. Perfect. A very good impression. I mm. I I have interviewed several musicians and got to know people and. All of them mentioned, you know, the Abbey Road, the Abbey Road. Uh, no, no, no. My album could be terrible, but it was recorded on Abbey Road. So, of course, the answer lies in between, right? They can be great engineer, a great studio, but but you can work with a guy like you in a small place and known and a no name and sound better than than an album recorded at Abbey Road with with Johnny Dawn, whatever the name of the picture. You know why? Why is people Still are fixed that oh no, my album was recorded that we wrote for just for the prestige. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting question. Things have really changed in, in that respect. Um yeah. I mean th these days, uh I mean certainly since lockdown, I, I've worked on my <laughs> pretty much uh, remotely on my own. Uh yeah. and um uh th the whole if you know if I'd known sort of decades ago how how you can do things so um conveniently and in the box as we call it where um you know the, these days it's easier for me to do everything within uh my software and computer and the equipment i have rather than relying on uh a lot of outboard equipment which is wonderful it's true but it's the flexibility that you have with working with with um this equipment these days that makes it less um crucial what the environment is like i mean to me the, the important thing for an um, uh, an environment where i'm mixing is just the mood that i uh, that i can create uh almost more than the sound of the room um for recording obviously for recording a band you want a good sounding room and you want a good way of capturing things but um it it is becoming it is, with so many people creating records in so many different ways these days it, it really has changed the the industry uh a lot of people are making you know doing their basically doing their recordings in their homes or their private studios and then bringing in someone to finish it off um so um Again, it depends on it depends on the music, and if you want to capture a group of musicians playing live at the same time in the same room, 
then it's really important to have a good a good ambience and a good recording space but uh again it depends what the genre is and, and what's needed what kind of record you're making it's uh it's never the same twice you know yeah and, and, and i suppose as a mixer record engineer and, and, and all the title that you have um i suppose that there were moments you don't know who is a scale so their music that perhaps you didn't like and or you were not fan of it and it's still you needed to do they were hired to do a job right so you needed to you know but do yeah. do you do your work do the best you can although the, the money the band is terrible or the personality of the person is terrible or i don't know it was heavy metal crazy people whatever whatever you know and you need to do your job right you need to do the best you could for that absolutely. eight hour shift right so, so. absolutely um you know at, as i say it really uh, half the time it, it, it it's you know one it's one thing having uh the right environment the right equipment the right techniques that, and the right um uh all the sort of uh things that you can do and the people can do but what really makes it all ultimately important is is the it's the connection between people and the communication even the friction you know there are albums where the friction between people create great musical moments you know when i work with a band like uk which is yes. bill Bruford and alan holdsworth and john wetton and Ed, eddie jobson there was kind of a, a very divided uh atmosphere within the band trying to go this way or that way and uh and that created incredible musical tension which you can hear and and so uh you know there's nothing bland about it <laughs> it really feels <laughs> like feels like you know they are reacting with each other and um or you sometimes feel the real unity between all the members of a band and mm. uh and so the process of recording um so often it, it, it's more to it's more like uh being a uh a therapist <laughs> than being, than being well, a technician <laughs> yeah know? i know what you mean i know what you mean <laughs> Because it, there gotta be moment where I don't know any band, right? There was one guy in the left view, one guy in the right, the, someone in the back is screaming at the other two, and you were in the middle. So what do I do? You know, it's, need to well, listen, you, but yeah. I need to keep quiet, I need to keep to myself. I cannot argue with these people. But well, those tensions it, sometimes are good, sometimes it's bad, right? So you're in the middle. This is where you have to try and learn to be a diplomat. Either that, or or a, 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 like the judiciary in the middle. Uh, it's it's good to have um, uh, decision making, you know, the clear decision making, and uh, uh, so it, it used to be very interesting before we had automation for mixing. Yeah. Uh, Normally, you would sit with the producer and the engineer, and maybe the assistant engineer, to have your hands on the controls because there was no automation, and you had to get things on the go. So when you're doing a mix, it was going straight to you'd record on tape, you'd play the song, you'd move the faders to get the dynamic and the levels and everything right. But sometimes you get a band come in without a producer uh and so suddenly they are self-producing but it's like each member of the band is is kind of concerned with their own input and they'd want to help with the mixing and so the engineer will be at the desk but the drummer will want to control the faders from his drums and the bass player will want his bass oh. and the list and this used to lead to what was called fader fighting because um e each person in the band Okay, it wasn't always like this, but occasionally <clears throat> they just wanted themselves to be the loudest thing. So the faders would get higher and higher and higher. And in the middle, you'd be the uh, engineer trying to find a way to pull things back and get them under control again. So that's why I say uh, there's the whole 
thing of trying to be a diplomat uh, being involved. But I have to say there are loads of musicians out there who are so um, aware of how things should work and they can be fun to work with. But um, again, this it, it depends on the status of all the people involved in the project. If you're working with a solo artist, then you've got a very sort of fixed idea of what you're doing. That's why working with someone like Kate Bush, who has a very clear vision of what she's doing, that, that, that makes it easy. Um, some people are undecided and like to experiment and try things out, and that drags out the process. So <clears throat> you have to sometimes develop patience to uh, get along with that. And um, as I say, sometimes you have uh, multiple people who might have disagreements and it's a question of, that's one of the reasons why Rush was always good to work with, the three piece. There was always a majority uh, if there was any kind of disagreement on something. Four right. piece band could be split down the middle and you're stuck. That's right. But the three piece was good. <laughs> that's, that's right. Nothing wrong with argument, nothing wrong with... You know, uh, giving, no, no. you know, throwing each other back and forth to different people is the yeah. problem when they, they stem a screaming, you're in the middle, and you know, yeah. it, it gets complicated. Yeah. Uh, Nick Davis was telling me that nowadays, um, kind of big recording studios are going away. A good, a good, a good example would be the farm, right? Mm. Nowadays, with the power of computer and sampling and a fast, computer and if you know what you're doing you can do you know decent recording decent mixes at home without leaving your home right absolutely yeah yes you can i mean uh, <clears throat> these days there are several stages to how i work uh, uh, when i'm mixing i mean i i yeah. don't really do any recording much these days except for my own uh solo works which is that's a bit different but yeah. um but you can do so much work on a pair of headphones uh, on a laptop um, to get things going. It, uh, and then maybe you want to move into a room which has a good sound and good speakers to refine that. And then maybe you want to move into a larger room to work on the surround sound. And it's good to compare how things work on different levels. But it's amazing how much of the work you can achieve and even finish literally on a laptop with uh, a pair of headphones because the software and the uh, emulations of uh, vintage equipment and everything are absolutely genuinely superb. And sometimes you, you can almost get better results. I'm not saying always, it's uh, to each his own, because I know there are a lot of people out there who are a real analog sort of... Uh, Freaks who who want to go back to all the original methods. I'm I I like working with whatever's in front of me. You know uh, what's available. Uh, to me, it's more about the ideas and then finding a way of realizing them. Yeah, and sometimes I suppose uh, a band wants you to remaster an album that was recorded in the eighties. I don't know 40, 40 or so years ago and. And they, the old tapes are in bad shapes, you know, and it's uh, right. It's sometimes what is brought to you, you know, what you're coming from you is not, you know, the best quality to begin with, right? You were not in the room, you know, recorded that, that particular album, you know, the re engineer and somebody, yeah. hey, an another band, Claudio, you know, yes. you know, did an album four years ago and they bring to you and, you would say, well, where's the real tape? But that's the best you got. It's not that great. And you need to kind of redo a lot of the work, right? Well, you these days, um, the technology we have and uh, the software we have and techniques are pretty incredible. Um, the, the stuff you can do in terms of restoration or yeah. um, extracting, uh, you can extract the... Uh, the bad stuff, the distortion and the noise and get rid of it, or you can extract um, musical uh, components or whatever. You can do a lot. You have to be careful because sometimes the initial character of the recordings, even if they weren't perfect or whatever, sometimes that's really important to uh, for that to be um, 
retained. Uh, it, it's these days it's quite easy to over um, to over process or over clean up things. But at the same time, if you've got a bad recording originally and you want to try and get more from it, um, it is possible. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful when you're doing remastering or re remixing yes. because some people will always um, want to uh, say that the original is the, you know, is the definitive version and you're playing with and messing with something that was already complete. Other people say, well, I've, you know, uh, when it's redone, now I can hear what it was supposed to sound like. So it's it's an interesting world where so much is being revisited, either remastered, uh, which is just a way of cl clearing or adding more definition to the existing picture or remixing which is a way of you know changing the uh the sonic depth and the individual balances and the arrangement there's so many things you can do so uh, it's made the whole reissue and remix thing very interesting and I, yeah. i'm very lucky to have been brought into that but you know it is what what you can do with the technology you can emulate yeah. Sometimes I find myself wanting to emulate, if you like, the uh, what was, if you like, wrong with the original <laughs> equipment. Because uh, 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 sometimes things are recorded too cleanly and you want to actually dirty them up a bit to get them to feel more appropriate. So, really? Um, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seemed like there was an obsession in the 80s to make things clean and digital audio came in where there was less tape noise or tape distortion and uh and you started to get a bit of um everything beginning to sound rather similar and all the rest and i think what people forget is that uh the approaches to recording and the equipment you use whether you're technically correct or not uh, is always going to add character and you know, I think character and sound is really important. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I completely agree. Nowadays, yeah. uh, a lot of bands, uh, a lot of recording engineers like yourself are hired to uh, do um, an Atmos mix or 5.1 mix or deluxe box or whatever. Yeah. And then still, majority of people, I suppose, listen to MP3s in the car, right? They don't have a CD at home. They don't have, you know, a, I don't know, three thousand dollars to buy a, a good equipment to listen to a yeah. five point one atmos. So, what's it's what's your what's your take on this? I mean, it's a lot of money and effort mm. that may go yeah. go into zero point zero five percent of the population, right? So, well, it, it it is it's difficult. I mean, I I have become very involved, if you like, in the sort of. Uh, in the rather elite world of uh, yeah. physical products for people yeah. who are enthusiasts and collectors. Um, and that is that is uh, a market that, you know, is taking care of itself. Um, uh, uh, as you say, a lot of people are only either streaming or um, at least streaming platforms, the quality is, is getting better. But as you say, some people still... Um, it, you know, they might be reluctant to get into really getting more interesting uh, playback systems. Mm. So this is actually where the Atmos idea being developed on platforms like Apple and uh, Spotify and things, it, it's where they're trying to get people to have a more of an experience on normal equipment on normal headphones on a phone on on your laptop uh where you can hear a good quality either stereo or spatial uh version uh some people it's not so much the sonic character they're looking for it's it's they're looking for the music itself and the version of what they're listening to or the arrangement so 
you have to sometimes make a distinction between presentation as opposed to the format that you're listening on. You know, um, I think, you know, we'd all rather watch films on a big screen in a cinema or a home cinema system than on your phone. But some people do like to watch things on their devices. So therefore, the important thing is what is that you're trying to uh, trying to show or uh, let people hear or look at um, and try to make it work on any platform in a sense is quite important uh, and so it's the material and the you know it's the, the material itself that's still the most important thing S sound quality or visual quality is important but it's the content and the way it's presented uh you know, you can see a really simple black and white film that's got great cinematography that works at any size you watch it. It's it's the way it's being presented to you that's important. Um, or you can see something that's uh, full uh, modern, you know, um, you know, a lot of these action films and things like that. They're very impressive, but you might get really bored with it, but something that's a simple black and white film with very few cuts and mm. great acting and great story can really get your attention. So ultimately, it's it's what are you trying to portray or make people feel? And um, so that, to me, coming back to where I fit into, you know, if you like, presentation, it's, uh, for me, first and foremost, it's, it's how you want somebody to experience something. Um, and it, even if you're listening in mono <laughs> on a small speaker, you can still influence the way that the, uh, the story is told, the sonic story and the musical story, or in, in a massive theater with, 64 speakers, uh, the cinematic atmosphere system. Um, it's just nice to be able to cover all the bases, but at the root of it, it's the material that's so important. Uh, it, it, for you, with all the experience and all the recording session and all the people you have worked, it, it's, it's possible when you are at home, when you are not working, you know, cooking with your wife or friends or whatever, to turn your your brain off the music and you're in the kitchen and you put an eye, somebody put a tune to a window or the or you go to get a cup of coffee and it's man, that's recorded terrible or it was great. Or can you turn that on and off? Or you are always the engineer. No, do, do you, you know what? No, I, d I never think of things like that. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's funny. Uh, uh, I suppose I. I stick to my philosophy. I know it's a story I've told a few times, but um, to me, it's not. It's not about making good recordings. It's about making great records. And this is something I think I've told the story before that, that came up talking with Hugh Padgham in a pub, like in the back in the uh, early eighties. Yeah. He was talking around. And he said. No, it's not about making good recordings. It's about making great records. And that stuck with me over the years. I if I don't really want people to listen to something that I've done and say, oh, that's a really great drum sound or that's uh, I really like that or whatever the rest. Um, I've, I want them to just feel it's a good record. It's, you know, what is relating to you um yeah, yeah. so i'm so I, I i tend not to i mean yes there are occasionally things i hear and i think oh yeah that doesn't sound very good but uh but most of the time i i i um i i don't listen in any kind of a uh analytical way to other people's work i i try and experience it as, as it's intended to be experienced and just let it talk to me.
So yeah, I I I I tend not to listen to other records and say, oh, if I'd done that, I would have made the uh, I would have put more reverb on the vocal. You know, I I don't think like that. I <laughs> would <laughs> you you cannot have like a a life outside work, right? You know, if you're exactly? own, otherwise it, the world would drive you crazy because you cannot have a a life outside work if you always put in the hat of the hat of uh oh yeah no it drive, to a it drive to in the supermarket or yeah yeah or... <laughs> no 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 I tend not to do that um uh and I probably the thing is I probably watch more um like film and uh TV series and things like that than I do listen to music anyway. Really? I the, the, the uh, one interesting thing um that I tend to think is that I don't go looking or going out of my way to listen to a lot of material because um over the years I've tried not to allow myself to be too influenced by other um productions. Uh I So I know some people are real enthusiasts about listening to everything that's out there and all the rest. I, I, I mean, I'm not talking about people like you because that's that's what you do. But I'm that's talking do, about yeah. people who are, if you like, involved in the production world. Um, I've never tried to be influenced by what's the current trend or anything like that. Uh, so I tend not to listen to a lot of new music unless somebody goes out of their way to really recommend something or if I accidentally come across something. But um, but I don't go listening to what I think the trends are because I want to try and keep my approach to being my, you know, my imagination and all the rest. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, I don't know if that's interesting or not, but uh, but, you know, I try and keep, keep myself fairly focused in the world I, I'm in. And I really I really get immersed in the project I'm doing at a particular time. And it's like I try not to get distracted by other music while I'm working on but we'll watch movies and things like that. Yeah. Some musicians have told me in the past that okay, they have a project uh they will start recording will they have sessions for let's say July, right? In a week from now, right? So mm. they will not listen to the radio, other music for at least two weeks. Right. Because they have, they don't want to, you know, have influences from other musicians. They, yes. the one week or the two weeks prior before they go to studio, because they may think, well, it sounds like this or it sounds like that. And, and so I don't, you know, so. Well, th yeah, that's, um, I mean, it's good to hear that a lot of people think like that, but um, yeah. but also in this day and age where there are so many uh, issues with people being accused of stealing ideas or copying things, yeah. it, it, it does become difficult to um, to be totally original, um, um, particularly when in terms of songwriting or uh, writing melodies or riffs or things like that um but you know bringing that into the world of sound and uh all the rest is uh again i agree i i want if i'm starting a new project i don't want to come in with something having just influenced me um mm. so yeah that's an a, an interesting uh concept i think it's I don't know, maybe impossible, almost impossible to be a hundred percent original, if you will, right? Because we are bombarded with music, messages, social media, Facebook, YouTube, yeah. blah, blah, blah. so unless yeah. you've been living under a cave or you know, you don't have a computer at home or whatever, you know, is yeah. how can you not be influenced by lyrics or you exactly. know, a, a, a yeah. riff on a guitar or yeah. I don't think, yeah, I don't think people like go them. out of their right. way to. I don't think people go out of no. their way to steal ideas off. No, it's, of course not. It, as you not. say, it's it's just something has sort of leaked into their imagination yeah. somewhere else, and uh, so yeah, it's it, it, tough in that sense. But um, but. Uh, I'm glad I don't live in the world where I. I mean, I have to say that during the 
some of the 80s and some of the 90s, there seemed to be a requirement to fulfill a genre, particularly for pop records and things like that. Um, and I'm glad that most of the projects I've done sort of certainly in the since then haven't had that kind of commercial pressure um because that's tough i i i don't know if i'd be happy working in uh, the kind of genres where you have a complete team of people contributing to uh um how something comes together it, to, to me it's great working in a small team like with the yeah absolutely the producer the musicians maybe with some outside consultation from a record label but but it's nice keeping it all sort of quite tight and not just thinking let's make a record that sounds like you know you name the artist um yeah just because they've had success i think originality is quite often the thing that gets the most attention anyway Get yeah, the importance of microphones. I mean, in the studios, the way the way that you you mentioned that try the studio was um, very progressive because they they did whatever they wanted to do without following the norms. Mm -hmm. And in some studios and recording studios, I suppose that you can get like a mics for a hundred dollars or five thousand dollars or something in between. It it make makes a big difference um in in some ways uh you could and it's not i can relate this um having sort of started as a musician uh in in my life uh things like microphones are like musical instruments i think there is there is if you like you want to find the best guitar that suits you and your character and it, it, it works with how you play and i think that microphones can really it, it enhance maybe the sound of a vocal or um or the sound of a guitar or whatever you're using it on uh, to just get the best out of what you're doing it doesn't necessarily mean that you get the best result because sometimes i've heard some of the best singing results where somebody's recorded on a handheld microphone in in the control room and you've got a great performance rather than on a ten thousand dollar you know yeah. each microphone um mm. it depends what you're trying to do i mean I, that, that was always the thing i heard about freddie mercury he he, he used like a you know, one of those sure microphones handheld in the control room with the speakers playing and all the rest. And look at what he was able to do and the sound yeah. that came with it. Um, but, but with, you know, with some people having the finest instrument in the world really enhances what they're capable of. And so I'd say the importance of microphones is, is important with, uh, a lot of the time you want to capture the best and it, uh, the best result but also it's how you know particularly with singers it influences how they respond when they hear themselves so you know again it's character that if they've got the right microphone it does it really helps enhance what they're trying to do with their voice so um again i would just say that it really depends on the individual there's no there's no hard and fast rule for any of this it, 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 it um maybe in the world of something that's more traditional like classical music there is the best solution for recording the orchestra or the instruments but we work in a an interesting, much more experimental world in in terms of um, whether it's pop music, progressive, electronic, experimental. Um, we're just lucky that we can, uh, you know, choose how we go. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, yeah, no 
You you mentioned Stephen before <clears throat> that um, you know cinema <clears throat> and uh, movies and uh, black and white is very important <clears throat> for you. You know it's top three, top three uh, movies pictures that you that you couldn't live without. Oh goodness me! Top five. Or the director that you like, I don't know. Oh, oh, th off the top of my head, that's really hard. I mean, well, um, mention a few. <laughs> well, uh, okay, um, uh, the one of the Ealing comedy films, Kind Hearts and Coronets, uh, which is yes. a, an ancient film in black and white that is just yeah. staggering in in so many kinds of levels. Uh, there's that. I don't know. I mean, on the other hand. Um, and I suppose this has more to do with atmosphere and everything. 2001 Space or, or, or yes. is, is, um, is probably one of my most memorable experiences. Mm. It lived with me having seen it at a very young age, uh, mm. probably 11 or 12 times in cinemas when it came out. Um, and that certainly was sort of i mean that was very high quality for for its time anyway but uh very unusual portrayal of, and storytelling um Ooh. other movies oh goodness me um i mean i do like space movies and science fiction i'm not talking about big action things but things like arrival uh yeah. oh yeah. Like, yeah which for me yeah. is totally at atmospheric you know it, it, it comes back to this it's it's what things make me feel particularly something like arrival it, um it, there's a great connection between the soundtrack and what you're looking at um and and how that makes you feel so on the one hand yes um you know i'd say there are some simple black and white movies i'd probably have to think a bit harder to give you some examples maybe we could do yeah. that next time <laughs> but, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but um but uh yeah movies i'd have to think about it because um i've seen so many movies and you know i have to come up with the top five at some top point five. i i have a um a, you know a music well i have not seen that many movies i suppose as yourself but i have about in my music collection about i don't know 500 600 film scores mm -hmm. so i have seen movies with terrible soundtracks in my opinion and then movies with great soundtrack yes and i have listened to hundreds of film score that some of them were rejected and then some of them I have never seen the movie. I like the film score. And, uh, it, you know, when I put on a Friday night, you know, I put music, I put my headphone, I listen to a film score without seeing the movie. Um, and then it trans transport me, takes me place. I can try to imagine how the movie would be vision. Uh, you know, how the movie could be. I have XYZ film score, right? Uh, yes. soundtrack right never seen the movie maybe i never seen the movie i would never see you know maybe it wasn't done whatever and i it it music for film score is is great it's very difficult very difficult to make a living it's very difficult to be right i suppose um you can as i say before uh sometimes great movies with terrible film score and then mm. sometimes both great great movie and of course, you know, it kind of a great, it was yeah. uh, Hans Zimmer or Jerry Goldsmith or, I don't know, John Williams or yeah, you know, Popol Boo or whatever, you know. So. Yes, I find, yeah, I do find film scores uh, very important and um, they can, you know, the wrong score can definitely destroy a movie. Um and I quite like the more simple ones on the whole. Uh, I mean, uh, is it Thomas Newman? I, I particularly Thomas Newman, yeah. His his, his work um, ha, has an emotional linking with what you know, what the story is telling you. And uh, um, I mean, I, I love John Williams too. He's quite uh, versatile in in terms of um, the different kinds of 
scores. I mean, the the more sort of orchestral, the uh, you know, the Star Wars and things like that are one thing. But um, but you know, then you go to Close Encounters and you get something that's just so Ooh. sort of mood setting or Jaws even. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's clever. <laughs> it's, it's it's clever how that can really hook into the. It, it feels like. Um, Occasionally, you get a feeling that the director and the score writer have worked hand in hand all the way through, and uh, and that can be brilliant when it works well. Mm. And um, I suppose in our world, in the sort of music world, it it it, it sometimes is important that the right sort of connection between uh, all the people involved can really help with how something ends up being presented and that's that's where I, th I know a lot of people are self-producing these days but um but sometimes when you get the right production team and uh, and music production works on all different levels on the one on the one hand it, it can be that you are just like quality control i think i mentioned this earlier uh at the other end of it uh you're totally involved in the thinking behind it not just in mm. the presentation of it so uh, mm. so it's a nice variable job yeah. i might i might i might have to uh draw, draw this to a close soon actually. sure sure yeah. sure <laughs> you're all we... such a lot to think about <laughs> yeah we oh we've been talking an hour yeah we need well i'm quite sure we do uh, we'll do many many part two part three because we need to go into your career. We need to talk about Kate Bush. I know we've just been talking and, about... Uh, yeah. But it's very interesting stuff. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, very... I hope, that, I hope that there's something interesting for you. Oh, no, very, very, uh, very... Uh, of course it is. Thank, thank you, Roger, Stephen. Of course, we'll send you an email. We'll arrange part two, part three, part four, and uh, maybe we'll write a book out of it. Oh, that would be good. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a lot to tell, and then sometimes it's just like... You, you don't know where to begin and where to end, so it's That's helpful right. to have somebody steer you in the right direction. Yeah, it was very nice talking to you, Steve. Have a Thank very, you. Great, great afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Great to meet you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, bye.